we have more connection to people from this distant past than we might have thought. You really have to be really creative when you're performing with these instruments um, to give an interesting um, performance, yeah. I'm convinced that the audience can be really worldwide. Please welcome John and Patrick Kenny and Alberto Moreni. to effectively bring things back to life and breathe life into them quite clearly is something which has appealed greatly to many people who had no expectation whatsoever. It satisfies the human desire for experiment and discovery. This was fabulous. It was uh, a trance. I went into a trance. It otherworldly. So the oldest instruments that we're playing tonight, well, would be the conches, which are instruments, but they're also nature objects, and we know that human beings have used them for at least 100,000 years, maybe more. Then the next would be the uh, Etruscan lituus and the uh, Loch and Shade horn, which are approximately 2,200, 2,300 years old. I'm based in London, play trombone in London and other places um, across quite a wide variety of styles, mainly like uh, jazz and pop. Um, that's normally why too. Yeah. Improvising is pretty similar to playing trombone and jazz in some ways. Um, but you're creating soundscapes when performing ancient instruments, which is the main difference, I think. Um, and you also have to get used to the tonality of these instruments. They're um, uh, not in Western tonality, really. Um, the intervals are different, so you have to get used to them being out of tune. This, this wonderful beast has become the, uh, the symbol of the EMAP exhibition, partly because it's very eye-catching. Well, this is a carnix. So this was made by Celtic people in the south of France um, 2,200 years ago, approximately. The sound passes through the head into these ears, and it adds a zing to the sound. The most fascinating thing I find is um, the way they speak. So different instruments speak a complete different way. Uh, for instance, the Loch Ness Shade Horn has a very, very, it's very soft. Um, you don't need to put that much air through it to create a really 
warm sounds, whereas uh, some of the other ones you have to work quite a lot harder to do that, and they're better at making aggressive sounds. So I think, yeah, the most fascinating thing is, is the, uh, the nature of the sounds that each of them produce and how different they are. The biggest audiences that we had for music, archaeological concerts, it's five, six hundred people uh, in a single concert. We can improve these, uh, these numbers. Tonight I will be playing the Gothic harp, which is uh, an instrument, a copy made from a painting from the mid 15th century, that's it. Well, I feel kind of small, <laughs> a small part in a, something bigger, which is a nice feeling, very nice feeling. I think the need to make music and the desire of people to experience music is something that's timeless in human beings. And human beings always, always are waiting to have a new experience. It's the nature, it's what makes us human. Det går ju rakt in i själen när kraften är. Alltså det, 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 det känns som en urkraft. Alltså det känns som att det kommer liksom från jordens inre nästan. På Man blir meditativ av det hela. Det är amazing att vara i en historisk tid. Att kunna lyssna till något som inte har spelat. Så det var en stor gift. Musik är timeless. Vi kan använda dem och discover how they are activated and what they may have sounded like and it is as valid now as it was two or three thousand years ago and that makes music archaeology unique in the whole realm of archaeology that's why we're here